All right, hold on one second, making sure I'm the first successful speaker of this pandemic uh, conference. All right, great. So like Natalie said, uh, I am Dr. Dara Kaff. I am a frontline emergency medicine doctor at Columbia University Medical Center, who unfortunately also uh, got COVID myself. I've tried to make myself useful over the past few months, actually communicating best practices to people uh, in New York City, around the country, and even around the world sometimes, uh, translating a lot of the science and impact of what's happening for their lives. It's been a really difficult time uh, for many people, but most importantly, I've learned a lot about clinical decision-making in a time of true uncertainty. I've also seen the cost of communicating badly and how it undermines our public health and our ability to move forward sometimes at all. So I'm gonna take some time to discuss what I've learned about clinical decision-making and leadership uh, during an evolving and uncertain time. At the end of the day, it's public trust that matters the most during an event like this. And you get that by leading with basically three things, honesty, humility, and humanity. So first we're gonna talk about honesty. There have been so many things we haven't known and actually still don't know about COVID-19. A brand new pandemic brings so much anxiety and very, very little certainty. Many recommendations that we had early in this pandemic were actually just our best guesses. They weren't really evidence-based, which is a departure from how we tend to practice medicine. At least that's what we hope. Uh, but being honest about what we were certain to be true and what we were just figuring out was actually an early issue we had to work out because it really isn't the way experts like to communicate with the public. Take the situation with masks. So right now, we think it's obvious, right? Masks are cheap, they're effective, they're life-saving. We've really kind of come to a collective understanding about how important masks are. But six months ago, when we first started recommending masks, we didn't really know how important they would be to stop this pandemic. What we did know, was that it was a respiratory virus, it was transmitted by droplets, and there was no antidote or treatment that was effective for this virus, so prevention was probably key. It made sense that masks work um, as a way to protect each other with very little downside. I mean, other than the cost of distributing masks or the risk of healthcare workers not getting masks, there really wasn't a downside. And so we even started suggesting homemade masks using socks, or some people even used underwear, uh, to make a homemade mask to keep themselves safe. We also saw the emergence of controversies, things like you know, conspiracy theories around carbon dioxide retention or decreases in oxygenation. We saw people talk about the risk of natural immunity and hindrances of the normal respiratory flora that might get in your, in your way. And we were able to use normal narratives to say, well, surgeons wear masks all day and they tend not to pass out. So we had to be both humble and honest about the fact that we were guessing on the idea that masks would be preventative, but that really this downside that people were promoting didn't seem to be all that realistic. And I think that a lot of people weren't as um, honest about how much this was more of a guess than a mandate. And the reason why that's important is because as the evidence came out reinforcing that this was really a not just a best guess, but it was turning into real evidence-based medicine, there wasn't a lot of space for that evolving information. So in Missouri, somewhere around May, we started seeing uh, states open up. And we started getting the evidence that masks really were working and we could start even increasing our recommendations for using masks. So we realized that hairdressers in Missouri who were both infected and symptomatic, although not quarantining because they weren't positive that they knew because they couldn't get tested, took care of uh, multiple customers at their hair salon, over 150 customers. And we know that they didn't transmit the virus to their customers. The hairdressers both got the virus probably from each other in the break room. But because the customers were masked up and the hairdressers were masked up, nobody was, tra the, trans the virus was not transmitted amongst, um, between the customer and the hairdresser. That was really good evidence to help us really reinforce that masks work. And we started um, seeing other evidence of community spread being limited with mask wearing, things like the social justice uh, protests in June. Um, whereas if people weren't wearing masks, so the intimate gatherings over holidays or church choir practices or um, other kind of group activities, 
that we knew for a fact there were no masks, we would see, you know, super spreader events. And we realized that over and over again, masks were reinforced as being useful. And we could now start saying with evidence-based certainty uh, that masks were useful. And I think that that honesty about the evolving information, and now we knew for sure that masks, we had the data, allow, would allow us the space to increase our recommendations because it would stop people from throwing it back in our face and say, oh, well, before you only gave two recommendations for masks, now you're giving six. I also think that honesty is the reason why New York City was so successful at uh, clamping down on the virus when it happened in March and April. We were getting daily briefings from our governor uh, that were both honest and transparent about how difficult the situation was in New York City, but the work we were doing was working. We were seeing numbers every single day of hospitalizations, of intubations, and of deaths. And as soon as we saw those numbers come down, I think it reinforced the work that New Yorkers were doing and it kept people moving forward. People do need honest, transparent, and a lot of times inspiring information. You know, trust is the first thing you need um, in an evolving healthcare, trias, uh, healthcare crisis, and there is no trust without honesty. We also need to show humility. We need to be open to feedback and to acknowledge when our guidance was wrong. And we need to own that truth. We need to admit our mistakes because public trust is cumulative. It's from countless interactions. And if any of those interactions go wrong, it can easily undermine the entire perception of truth from the public. I think one of the areas that we've been wrong a lot is our communication around testing. I don't want to talk about the national failure to have an organized testing practice and testing policies because we couldn't have prevented that. But we were making mistakes on the ground early in this pandemic about how we communicated who should be tested. In New York early on, we didn't have enough tests and we really could only test people that were not just symptomatic, but being hospitalized. And for weeks, we saw patients even in the hospital who were being discharged without even confirming um, whether they did or did not have the coronavirus. We saw patients at home on telemedicine in the community and we said, you probably have this virus and you should quarantine from your family. You shouldn't go to work if they were going anywhere at all. And you'll be recovered from the virus in you know 10 to 14 days, whatever our best guess was at the time. Uh, and then when they left their quarantine and went back into their communities, they expected to have already been recovered from this virus. Somewhere around there, uh, you know, we started getting antibody tests and these people who had gone through the emotional turmoil of thinking that they had been exposed and recovered from this virus I uh, found out that they didn't have antibodies. Now, some of those people probably didn't mount a reasonable antibody response because of the kind of infection that they had, but others didn't have the virus. And we're not really internalizing the emotional effect of believing you have a life-threatening virus for two weeks in your bedroom, not being able to confirm that test, and then finding out after the fact that it didn't matter and you didn't have it. We said to people in real time, it doesn't matter if you know you have it, pretend that you do. And it does matter. It matters about how you quarantine. It matters how you take care of your family. It matters how you uh, look at your symptoms. Um, it matters how you do contact tracing. If you know for a fact that somebody is positive, you will make more effort to contact trace and tell their uh, contacts that they have to stay home. Um, we didn't say to people, we have no options and all of, you know, we have no tests and our options are terrible and we're making the best decision we can. We somehow tried to convince ourselves that testing wouldn't have made a difference in their clinical outcome. We didn't want to scare people and we didn't want them to feel hopeless. And we needed to walk a fine line between making people feel supported and convincing our own selves that we were doing the best we could. So I think we, we led people down the wrong path. We told them they didn't need to be testing when they did. We're asking people to trust our guidance. And if we want their trust, we need to be humble enough to admit after the fact, especially that our guidance was wrong and that even our messaging was wrong, um, even when the circumstances were beyond our control. The final thing we need to do to build public trust with the general public is to lead with our humanity. That means being sensitive to what other people are going through. And sometimes it may mean being transparent with what we're going through ourselves. So March 19th, 2020, I was diagnosed with coronavirus. And right around that time, I had started seeing a lot of stigma around who was getting infected, how and why. 
on Facebook and other social media groups, you were seeing people point fingers and say, oh, that person exposed, you know, how many people to the virus and who was having to quarantine. And when I started having symptoms, I had expected to get the virus. In all fairness, emotionally, I had totally set myself up for it. Um, and then I started getting symptoms and I didn't really, I actually didn't even internalize that that's what they were because I didn't know firsthand what it was gonna feel like. It actually felt pretty terrible. Uh, by the time I got tested three days later, I uh, realized that I really needed to know, was I positive? Not only for myself, but I had a transplant child. My eight-year-old son had a tra liver transplant when he was two years old. I already moved him out of my house, but I needed to know if I could see him at all. Uh, I got tested. I pulled some strings a little bit. I went to a friend that I knew had capacity to test, and I was able to get tested. And I will tell you that looking at that, that, that result that says SARS-CoV-2 positive, um, detected is what it actually says. Uh, it's unlike anything else, especially in the beginning of a pandemic. You start to wonder, am I going to be short of breath? Am I going to have to go to the hospital? Will I need to get intubated? Oh my God, I could die. Um, and those feelings are overwhelming, but more importantly for me, it meant that I had to share them with other people because one of the things I needed people to stop doing was point fingers at others who were infected and wondering if they had had then spread the virus to other people. So I made a decision to be very, very public about my infection and my anxiety for myself about what it meant. I needed to tell, show people that my symptoms were real and I wasn't crazy, even though in my head, I thought that the cough and the muscle aches were just me feeling tired and overwhelmed. Um, I worried about my kids and my husband. I was living with my husband in the house and I needed to really be honest about my anxiety about giving the virus to him. How were we living together? Were we wearing masks in the house? How was I eating? How was I using a common bathroom with my, hu my husband? I mean, there's all these things, these decisions you make in the moment when you have this virus that are just not talked about collectively when we talk about vaccinations and therapeutics. Um, and so I shared my experience publicly. And even when I was deciding how to come out of quarantine, because I felt like sharing that humanity and that anxiety was really important for other people to feel connected to the work they were doing to prevent the spread of this virus. The other thing I want to say about the humanity of this virus is to recognize how this crisis affects other people's lives. So remembering that this isn't affecting everyone equally, the disparities we see in the healthcare system are massive and they affect different communities. You will find communities of color having an increased number, not just of infections, but of deaths. You'll see other communities that have a higher rate of unemployment and poverty related to this. People, we ask them to do these things around the virus, whether it's isolation or quarantining or testing, and we don't always acknowledge how that affects their lives. Without appropriate support and stimulation and stimulus around um, things like you know, isolation and quarantining and businesses were asking to be closed. We're, I, we're ignoring the humanity of the, the effects of this virus on people's lives. We need to acknowledge that there is nothing scarier than a disease you can't see. And sometimes one you don't even know you have and it's killing people around you and you don't know what to do. We can't underestimate those feelings. We can't ignore those feelings. We need to incorporate those feelings into our messages so that people understand that we care about them and that our goal is collective health and collective wellness. Our job is to meet this moment with honesty and not false hope, um, with humility and not false promises. And even when the medical community is stressed and taxed and discouraged to meet it with our best collective respect for the humanity of our patients, of our colleagues, our families and ourselves. Because that's how we're gonna build collective trust with honesty, humility, and humanity. And trust is what's gonna get us through this, no matter how uncertain the times are. Thank you very much.